Well, hi everyone, and welcome back to Public Speaking Online. Today we're going to be talking about public speaking truly as a Western approach, but then also diving into speech formatting basics, or the intro, body, and conclusion, which is a speech format we'll be adopting for the rest of the semester. But first, let's pause. Here in the United Ta States, we take what I call a Western approach to public speaking, and I think others would agree. Well, what does that mean exactly? That is to say that we value structure, main point organization, the practice of establishing credibility with an audience, and building support or strong evidence for our claims. The truth is, in the United States, our version of public speaking is simply one form of a long-standing oral tradition. From a cultural and historical perspective, public speaking has been happening for centuries around the world and in a variety of forms. If public speaking truly is the act of communicating in front of a large audience for a specific purpose, then we can see how different forms of communication function to achieve that purpose. Communities around the globe have engaged in traditional storytelling, for example, as a form of public speaking, passing along their learning, knowledge, wisdom, humor, experiences, and cultural traditions in a variety of different settings. It's a good reminder too that public speaking, this class, is not even a college requirement in a majority of the world but found as a GE class um, in only certain countries and communities, ours included. Sorry about that. All that to say that public speaking has been around for some time. So if you're still feeling nervous, join the populations of people for decades that have felt the same way. Whether from behind a microphone or on a stage, in front of a classroom, at a community meeting, religious gathering, tribal council, family gathering, or many more, public speaking is an act you might have to engage in. So let's get back to business then and learn about the formatting basics. Here you're going to be introduced to basic speech formatting, what we will practice this semester, the intro, body, and conclusion. Kind of like in a story, how you have the beginning, middle, and end. And there you have it. This format should sound really familiar because it's also what you might do in, let's say, an English 1A composition class. And a quick note, Chapter 9 from the Public Speaking Project online textbook is just one of many resources that you can use to get a really good comprehensive overview of introductions and conclusions. Now, when I share this lesson in class, I typically ask students to go ahead and take notes. Practice maybe even using this structure as an early outline for one of your previously brainstormed speech topics. You might even get some work done for later. Okay, so let's begin with the introduction. I'll pause just a moment here so that you can write it down if you'd like, but feel free to pause the video as well. I'll also come back to it. Notice too how I've numbered or seriated, organized the parts of the speech with the Roman numeral after or right before introduction and then capital letters and numbers for the subsequent parts. Now, a good rule of thumb is to plan between 15 and 20% of your total speaking time for your um, of your total speaking time just for the introduction portion alone of your speech. This means if you're giving a 5-minute speech that about 40 seconds to a minute would be your speech introduction. If nothing else, this statistic showcases the importance, time, and care that should go into a well-prepared speech. So, the attention getter. These are the first words out of your mouth, and they should not be, hi, my name is, and my speech is about. That's just boring, and you might even get docked a few points. Rather, this is a space to be really creative in your opener and to choose words that really grab your audience's attention. So here's some ideas. You could start by showing a creative photo, a sound or video clip, even using environmental elements like light or weather to get our attention. 
It could be a relevant and thought-provoking or relatable quote. You could use humor, a good joke or a funny story, but don't be funny if you're not funny. That's just real. You could also use a startling statement, a statistic, maybe even a research finding that's related to your topic. Or ask the audience a general question, something to get them moving, engaged, participating, thinking about your topic as it relates to them. A great way to encourage participation up front. Do, however, try to avoid rhetorical or hypothetical questions to the extent that they don't directly relate to your topic. If overused, they can come across as distracting, cliche, or even as a means to simply buy or use up their time. So let's move on then to the credibility statement, the next part of the introduction. Here's where you tell the audience why you are qualified to talk about a particular subject. And we get credibility in a variety of ways. First, by talking about our own experiences that make us a credible source, even education or training. Again, experiences that we've had perhaps at work or within certain settings. Whether we've participated in a religious community or a community group, these are all just to name a few. In short, your job is to tell the audience why you are a credible speaker. In other words, why we should listen to you. So how about that next part, the thesis statement or preview? Now, as you move toward the end of your introduction, you want to provide a clear purpose statement or a speech thesis. Now, notice I combined here the thesis with the preview, and that's because they often go hand in hand. What they do is state your purpose while also giving a roadmap to your audience of what it is that you're going to cover today. Now, in public speaking, we have a little phrase that goes, tell me what you're going to tell me, tell me, tell me what you told me. Why that bizarre repetition? Well, repetition is what makes the content memorable. And we all like to know where a conversation is going before it even gets there. That thesis purpose or statement is also a really good place for you to plug that universal theme or at least touch on it, that lesson that you want your audience to learn or take away. So here's an example. Let's say that you were giving a speech um, telling us a story about the first time that you took a road trip. A good thesis or preview, preview statement might sound like, today I'm here to tell you about, first, the time I road tripped across the United States, second, why it was the best decision I ever made, and third, why letting go of a plan taught me and might even teach you a valuable lesson. Moving on. Now let's talk about the body of your speech, which basically houses the main points and the support for those main points, or what we call claims. Therefore, a bulk of your speech will in fact be the body or these main points. Imagine dedicating 50 to 60% of your speech to just these body main points. I had a colleague once who called the main points your golden sentences, and I really appreciated the visual understanding their point. The main points of a speech are really like those pillars that your speech stands upon. They're central arguments, takeaways, and they should be arranged in an order and a way that supports logic, coherency, and flow for the audience. Another good rule of thumb is to have only two to four main points in any given speech. One main point, that's just weird. It's hard to convince anybody with just one thing. Two to four, way easier to manage, organize, and remember. Five or more main points, too much, too much, reel it back. Keep in mind that each main point that you provide should be supported by subpoints or the evidence. And evidence can take a variety of forms from research to quotes, facts, statistics, testimony, personal experiences, even a presentation enhancer, like a visual aid. And finally, transition. Really, the important thing to remember is that a transition goes in between each main part of the speech. The intro and the body, between the main points, and also between the body and the conclusion. 
Transition statements act as signposts for your audience, sort of telling them where they've been, but then also where they're going. So they serve a really important organizational function in the speech process, right? For example, you could say something like, now that we've heard about A, B, and C, let's move on to D. And finally, the conclusion. Again, this is arguably the most important feature of your speech and one that students tend to struggle a little bit with. Whether it's running out of time at the end of your speech or simply rushing just to get it over with. Oh, stressy. But about 15 to 20% of your total speech time should be reserved for the conclusion. That's how important it is. The same amount that you would spend in the introduction. Now, let me tell you why. Imagine that you got a text today from a significant other that simply stated, we're done. It's over. With no further explanation or context text provided, this would not only be startling, but for me, exceptionally disturbing. Fun fact, I recently learned that there's a term for this, and because I'm old and out of touch with things, I didn't know that it was called ghosting. Now, here's my two cents. Send a ghost emoji. Let people sleep at night. I get distracted. Okay, the truth is that we long for closure, whether it's in a relationship or a speech. It's a stretch, I know. Now, although you're not in a committed romantic relationship with your audience, the audience, too, expects some closure from you, and you can't ghost them. Whether it's, oh, what were those main points again? It's been a while. Or, so why is your speech important to me? What am I supposed to do with what I've heard today? Your job is to answer these nonverbal questions and to provide a solid summary and review of your speech content ending with something memorable. Did you know statistics show that up to 50% of your speech context or content rather is lost with just a few minutes after your speech? Add another 24 hours and the audience remembers less than 10% of your speech content. So the real question is, how can you make your speech memorable and stand out? Now here you've been introduced to the introduction, body, and conclusion, the three main parts of the speech that we'll be practicing for the rest of the semester. If you need to, go back and re-familiarize yourself with the different parts of the speech or refer to this as you need for the rest of the semester. Thanks so much.